In this video, I have a real treat for you. We're going to show you how to plot just about anything. This is lesson six. And here, this is what we're doing today. Lesson six, plot anything. We're gonna do bar plots, histogram, scatter plots, box plots, violin plots, density plots, dot plots, line plots for things like time course data, pie charts, and Venn diagrams, like if you wanna compare different lists of genes. So in this one, we're gonna use a new data set that has a lot more different kinds of columns and variables that we can deal with. So let's first take a look at our new data set. We'll load in ggplot, load the theme for plotting, just like we messed with in the last uh, lesson, in lesson five. We're reading in new data. Let's take a look at what we have in here. So this is some of my own data from some software that I've made, actually. And um, this data consists of variant calls that are called from an assembly just using some new algorithms. And it makes a good illustration for the different kinds of plots we can make because we have all these different columns. We have chromosomes, start and stop positions in the genome. We also have a name, which we can't really use for anything. The sizes can be really useful for distributions. Strand doesn't really mean anything. Uh, it just makes it a bed format, really. And then we have different types, which can be useful for categorizing the variants. And then there's also reference distance and query distance. You don't really have to worry about what these mean, but in case you're curious, the reference distance is the distance between two alignments in the reference versus then the query distance, which is the distance between those same alignments in the query. So like you're aligning a contig to the reference and you're seeing how the how there is a difference between the, what the query sees in the contig and what the reference sees along a real chromosome that you're comparing to. And so this is kind of the data set that we have. So there's a few different types. And don't worry about what's in the data set. We're just going to use it to show you some of the different kinds of things we can do. First, we're doing the same filtering and polishing of data that we normally do. Here we're seeing whether the chromosomes are in the list from 1 to 22, XY, or mitochondrion. If we look at the different types, we have some of the chromosomes here. There are a few variants that are called on these alternate chromosomes. And so we're just going to cut those out because they don't make a very nice plot. And they exist, maybe, but, but we're just going to exclude those. And we don't really have a Y and a mitochondrion in here. But this shows you how to get all of those, and it doesn't hurt to include more, because if the chromosome isn't in this list, it'll be excluded. And if there was a mitochondrion, we'd be including it, so that's good. In terms of ordering chromosomes, this time we don't have the CHR prefix, so that's nothing we have to worry about. And we're just going to keep it a factor and say I want the levels to be this list. So the last one excluded these GL ones. So if I do this summary again, they're now gone. There's only zeros here. And now I'm changing the levels so that those aren't even options anymore. And so if I do it again, the summary, now those are gone. And we still have the option of Y and mitochondrion, but we're not going to have any that fit into that type. Uh, as far as the my data types go, we have all these different words. And I want to decide which order they're going to be listed in in the legend when I use them. Or if I have them along the x-axis, I want them to be insertion, then deletion, then expansion, then contraction. Those are my four different variant types. So by doing the levels here, I decide what order I want them to be in. And again, the little C here just makes a list of these four things. So that's a list of four things. And so we're basically just reshaping the factor a little bit so that the levels are in this order now. And that's all we're doing here. So we'll run that too. And now let's do head of my data 
basically looks the same, right? And if we then create a simple bar plot, so here, again, the anatomy of one of these plots is we say ggplot, we always do that. Then we have the data. We then have the aesthetic here. So you do like my data, comma, then the aesthetic, and in parentheses, you put what you want each part of the plot to represent in your data. Here I'm saying the x-axis should be the chromosome, and the fill color should be the type. That's these types up here, insertion, deletion, expansion, contraction. And then this doesn't make any specific kind of plot until I do plus geome bar, which makes it a bar plot. So we run that, and now we see a bar plot. And we can see our chromosomes are in order, our types are in the order that I wanted, and we don't have any extra chromosomes or anything like that. So all good. So this is what a bar plot looks like. It's categorical, right? So the x-axis down here, it has a bar for different things. It's not numerical, so you can't make the bins any smaller or bigger or look at the distribution or anything like that. It's just a bar plot. A histogram looks really similar, actually. Notice how when we do this one, the only thing we change is the aesthetic in here. The fact that we have geome bar means that the histogram and the categorical bar plot are made using the same function, geome bar. The only thing we change is that the x-axis now becomes size, and size is a numerical variable instead of where chromosome was categorical like this. So when we draw this new kind of bar chart that's actually a histogram, we can see that each size doesn't get its own bin. They're kind of shoved together into bigger bins than that, otherwise it would be really hard to draw it. So this is a histogram, right? These are automatically stacked, the different types on top of each other. So that's great. It looks like we have a lot of variants that are on the lower size range. If I want to get a better view of this part of it, just the smallest variants, to see whether there's a more interesting distribution in smaller sizes, I can do this. I have the same exact thing. X equals size. Again, so like the x-axis has the size on it. Fill color is controlled by type. The column we had that was named type. Still geom bar. The only thing we're changing is xlim 0 to 500. And that means that the limits for the x-axis, meaning the edges on the x-axis, is from 0, and then we're going to end it over at 500, where right now it's ending above 9,000. So that's much bigger. So when I run that, it changes, so we're only taking sizes from 0 up to 500, and anything beyond that is just not going to be included in the plot. Okay? And here we see that there's a very different distribution. We have a little peak here around the 300s, which uh, might be the ALU elements. And so this is very nice. Uh, you can see a lot more now. But if we want the bars to be smaller, which we might want, because there isn't a very clear distribution, like we can see that there are the bars, but maybe we want better resolution. Then we still keep the xlim 0 to 500. But in geom bar, we specify this one little feature of the bar plot, which is the bin width. If you notice down here, it was saying, oops, it's saying this warning here that bin width is defaulted to the range over 30, meaning that it automatically makes 30 bins. And instead, we should say bin width equals x if we want to adjust it. So here, if I say bin width equals 5, it means that every time I move over 5 in the size, like 5 base pairs in size, then we're going to make a new bin. And so if we run that, we get much smaller bins. So now each bin represents 5 base pairs of size range. So those are the kind of things you might want to change for a histogram. And of course, if you want to make the x-axis anything else than size, you just have to switch out where it says size right here and make it something else. If you want the fill color to be something else than type, you can switch that out too. You just say fill equals one of the other columns from the table. 
So let's take a look at another kind of plot we can make. We also have scatter plots. Uh, in this one, I'm going to show you how to do it with that reference and query distance that we had before. So here, for a scatter plot, you generally want two numerical values, right? So you can have a numerical on the x and a numerical on the y. For the histogram and bar plot, we only had something for the x axis, and then the y ended up being a count like that, see? And then all we could set was the fill color if we felt like it, but that's not even necessary. You don't have to use that. If you don't use it, it'll just be black bars or something. They won't have a specific color or any kind of different types like that. For the scatter plot, we put in my data again. The aesthetic this time is the x-axis becomes the reference distance, the y-axis becomes the query distance, and we use geom point because now we want points instead of bars. If I run that, you can see what happens. So x equals query dis x equals reference distance, and y equals query distance, and we make points. It's pretty beautiful, actually. So some of the things we can do with a scatter plot to make things more interesting is we can color them by type as well. So here, x is still ref dist, y is query distance, and we say color equals type. Now notice before fill color was just called fill equals type, and now it's color equals type. This is one little kind of annoyance, basically, but it's just that when we had bars, it was the fill color of the rectangle that we were specifying, and now that we have points, it doesn't really have much of a fill color, so instead we just use color, so it's not fill it's just the color of the point. So whenever you have points, you use color, and when you have a bar plot, you use fill. And we'll see a few other examples of choosing these different ones. In general, what you can do for all of these is to copy some of this code for your own data sets and make little changes to the plots. So right now we're exploring a few of the different options that you have, and I'm gonna show you some of the different plots that you can make. But in general, the best thing to do is just to copy the one that looks most like what you want to make and stick in your own data in its place and play with it. That's what I do. So if you want to color by type for this scatter plot, we say color equals type. If we run that, it shows up. And notice how it just made a legend on its own without you having to ask it to. It's very nice. And that looks really good. Again, we can zoom in. Last time we had xlim set from 0 to 500 like that. This time we want maybe both the xlim and the ylim. And we can also set it to negative values. So here I'm setting the reference distance and query distance, both the x and y axis, to be from negative 500 to 500, and then negative 500 to 500 for y as well. If we run that line, this is what we see. So negative 500 to 500, negative 500 on the y-axis to 500 on the y-axis. And so this shows you how you can color by the different types. And we just say color instead of fill because we're using points. All right, we can also use coloring by a numerical va variable like size, where before we were coloring by type, which was categorical. So we have four different types that are possible. But if we color by size, we get something a little different. You actually can say exactly the same thing you did before. We just say color equals size instead of type. You don't have to tell it it's a numerical variable and it figures it out on its own. So instead of creating four different options, it creates a scale like this. The only problem is that there are actually only a few points in here that actually have a size this large. And so one point in here somewhere will be really light and the others will be dark. So maybe we want to reset the scale just like we zoomed in on the x and y axis. We can also change the color gradient to be along our own scale that we wanted. And the way we do this is we say scale color gradient. So you add that just like you've added the x limb plus y limb. Now we say plus scale color gradient. And here the limits for the gradient are from 0 to 500 instead of 0 to about a, 
uh, 10,000 up here. That would be 10,000. So if we run this, now we've changed the scale to be from 0 to 500, and now more of our points are at the lighter end where they are 500 in size. So that's how you can change colors on your scatter plot. You can either color by type for categorical, color by size for numerical, you can zoom in on the different axes, and you can change the scale of the color gradient for the numerical variables as well. And remember from the last video, you can tweak anything in these plots. You can change the labels on everything. You can change the color schemes and palettes and all that stuff. So all that is possible for you to change. Another thing we can do is create box plots. So let's move on to that. Box plots. This is what a box plot looks like. In this case, we have a lot of what looks like outliers. These are the dots that are outside of the normal range down here. So here we again go ggplot of my data. Aesthetic, this time we say x is the type. So that would be insertion, deletion, expansion, contraction. That's the type. And y is the size. And then to tell it we want a box plot, we say plus geom box plot. Pretty simple, right? And now I can change the fill color if I want, just to make it a little bit more colorful. And it automatically puts in this legend for us, again, whenever you specify the fill or color. And what you can do for all of these plots, which may come in handy for the box plot right now, is that you can flip the x and y axes around really easily. So you just put in coord flip. I'll put it on the other line here so we can see it like that. So you say plus and then chord flip. Put it back. And that flips it around so that now the y-axis just became the type and the x-axis became the size. So that way you can really easily flip it around and just see whether you like that look better for your plot. Awesome. Something similar to a box plot is a violin plot. So this is what a violin plot looks like. Notice the aesthetics are exactly the same, the AES here. X is type and Y is size. But instead of showing the box plot like this, we're showing the violin plot like that. So it's geom violin is the only difference here. And these look kind of sad without colors, so I'm going to put in some colors. And so that's fill equals type. So I'll just fill them in by the same type they have here. We can't really fill them by any other uh, variable right now. And I'll also zoom in, so y lim is 0 to 1000, so we've zoomed in the y-axis is now only up to 1000, and then guides fill equals false means I don't want a legend for the fill color. Okay, Guides means the legend, fill equals false means I don't want legend for fill color. And so by using that, it makes the legend go away, whereas normally it would draw a legend. Uh, another thing we can do here, let's take a look at what this one does. Yeah, so when you make a violin plot, you can also set an adjust. The only thing we've changed between the last plot and this one is notice how they're a lot more jagged right now. This is what it looked like before. And now when we set adjust like this, the default adjust value is 1, and the lower one means like a finer resolution to the density. So it's kind of like a density estimation. And so when you set the adjust, it just becomes kind of finer resolution, and it doesn't try to smooth it out as much. It's going to be at a finer scale, basically. So you can set adjust equal to any kind of value you want. You can also make it larger than it was before, so the default is 1. If you set it to 2, it'll be even smoother than this. But here I'm showing you what it looks like when it's lower. Adjust equals 0.2. So it looks really jagged. Another fun thing we can do with any, ax any numerical axis on any plot is to make it uh, a log scale. So if we take the violin plot just as it is like that, that's great. And we can add the log scale to it. So this says scale y log 10. 
So if I run those two lines together, it puts it all on a log scale. So you see here it goes from 10 to 1,000. So this is on a log scale and it spreads things out a lot more. So that's an alternative to zooming in, where before we zoomed in on some of the y-axis just from 0 to 1,000, and now we're just compressing those larger values essentially by doing the log scale. So you can do that to any numerical axis on any plot that you have. You obviously can't do it on the x-axis here just because there's nothing to log scale. You only have four different types. We can also create a density plot which is a lot like a violin plot but you just don't have it for the different types. You have it for one type. So like instead of lining them all up next to each other it puts them all on one axis like this. And so this is the sort of equivalent of the same thing we're showing in this histogram right here, if you remember that, where we made the bin smaller. We have the size, it's a histogram of the count, and we have the four different types. So doing this density plot, we say geom density, zoom in, it's basically the same thing, but it's the density estimation of those same data points. So this looks kind of bad because they're covering up each other. There are a few different ways of dealing with this, and I'll show you the best, like, three possibilities, probably. And so here, the geom density, you can say position equals stack, and instead of putting them all on top of each other like this, so they're overlapping, it'll make them actually go one on top of the other. The problem with this one is that it's really obvious that insertion has these two peaks but it's hard to see whether the other types share the peaks or whether they just look like they do because they are stacked on top of the insertions. So that can be kind of a problem. Another option is inside GM density, instead of doing position equals stack, you can say alpha equals 0.5 or alpha equals any other number between 0 and 1. And that's going to make them transparent. So now you can see all of them. So it looks just like if you were doing this one without the alpha, but we're just making them transparent so that we can see through and see where the other ones are actually going for the other types. And then probably the best option that looks the best is to just do a multifaceted plot. This is the sneak preview of lesson seven where we'll go more into this. But the general idea here is that we're just using this facet grid part and we're facet gridding it on the type on one axis and then nothing on the other axis. So I'll show you a lot more of that in the next lesson for multifaceted plots in lesson seven. But this is a good way of dealing with it. So we'll talk more about that later. There was a few different ways of dealing with the overlapping. We can also make dot plots, which are fun. They look like this, which looks like a total mess. Um, here, again, we say x-axis is size, fill color is type, that gives us a legend by default. Notice that the legend changes, so now these are dots, where in a box plot they're going to look like boxes, so it's really cute and helpful, like they actually give you the right types for your legend and everything just works automatically, it's amazing. Here we just do geom dot plot, so that gives us a dot plot, but the way a dot plot works is that each individual dot has to be one event. And so one of these is one event, and if you have enough events that the dots go outside the plot, they really just go outside the plot. The plot doesn't rescale to fit them all. So it's really good if you only have a couple of observations where each one matters, but you don't want it for these big things where you have distributions and you have more than a hundred events that are going to be on top of each other because then they'll stick outside the plot, which is not ideal. So one of the ways to deal with this is to just, in this case, break down our data into fewer data points by looking at only a subset of it. But a dot plot can be really good if you're dealing with a kind of data that only has a few observations to begin with and you don't have to make any subsetting of the data. The way this works is I'm taking a selection of my data. I'm sticking it into the variable large data and in brackets I'm saying which part I'm gonna keep. I'm saying I want all the rows where 
my data column size is greater than 5,000. If I run this, I'm going to get a lot of true and false values. And so those are going to tell me which rows do I want. It's always row comma column. I'll put that in here. So you do, yeah, rows and then which columns do you want. And here, if we want all the columns, then we just leave it blank, but you do have to have the comma. If you don't have a comma, it'll say that you're trying to index something and there are two dimensions, but you're trying to only give it one dimension. So you have to give it both rows and columns, even if the columns, you're just leaving it blank. So the comma has to be there. Oops. All right, so what happens here is we now have large data. This is a smaller subset of our data. And if we now do ggplot, instead of saying my data, we just say large data which is this smaller part of our data set. It still has the same columns that our data did before, so we still say x equals size, fill equals type, so we're doing the same thing we're doing here that we just did before, and we do geom.plot. And method equals histo dot. Now, here we have to be kind of careful because the dots don't stack automatically, which means that the contractions are always going to be plotted on top of the other things because they're plotted last. So you don't generally just want to do this as it is. You want to use stack groups equals true so that they stack on top of each other. So that's really important. You want to use this one and not just this one. And then that way our observations stack on top so you can see all the types and they're not overwriting each other. That's kind of a danger of dot plots because they don't stack automatically. And so here you can see there's a really large proportion of these variants. There's a bunch of variants that happen to be around this size right above 6,000 base pairs. So that's interesting and something we can look into, I guess. Yeah, so beware of stacking for dot plots. Um, these dot plots are really only useful when you want to be able to get a count for observations. You could do the same exact thing with a histogram where you just show the bars and that's just by doing like geom bar instead of geom dot plot. That's the only difference. Just like we did at the very beginning of the script at the top of the lesson. So yeah, uh, dot plots are not exactly my favorite but they can be really useful if you have small counts of data and you want to give an idea of how the individual counts are doing. If you're dealing with small data sets like if you only have uh, something like 20 mice and you want to get an idea of how each individual is different from other individuals then a dot plot could help you to really line up and see that one individual is different than just a proportion of the larger group of mice, for instance. Okay, so let's take a look at how to use a different kind of data. Um, if you have a time course where I'm going to show you some data that I kind of faked here. I made some time course data. So let's say we have these numbers of seconds. We're looking from 0 to 20 seconds and taking observations at different time points. And at each time point you get a different value. So those are your observations, whatever it is you're measuring. And you're doing this for two different samples, or two different mice, two different people, something like that. And you just have to have this sample where you say one of them is A and one is B. And so you want to have it in this kind of format. You don't want value for A and then value for B in another column. Because you want to be able to have the x-axis or the y-axis only represent one column and then use the sample to show the legend. So this is the kind of thing we can do with this. We can draw a plot. I'm going to make the size bigger here so if we say size equals 3 now we can see it better just for looking at it. And the way we do this, so we have, so now I'll explain it, ggplot has time course. Time course is this data here. We can see we have the column seconds value sample. So if you had two mice and you wanted to look at something about them that's changing over time, for instance, 
you would have like mouse one, mouse two. We have the time on the x-axis, the value on the y-axis. This is a very typical thing that you would probably want to do in some experiments. So we do x equals seconds, y equals value, that's x and y axes, and then color equals sample. Remember, we can't do fill color here. Um, and I can actually show you what happens if we try to do fill color. See, basically nothing happens this time because color indicates the color of the line and fill color doesn't really apply to this kind of plot. So whenever we have points or lines, you use color. And whenever you have an area like the violin plots, box plots, and histograms and bar plots, those are all rectangles in different areas, and you want to fill those in, then it's fill color that you use and not just color. Yeah, so in GeoMLine, we set size equal to 3 to make the lines bigger. Otherwise, it looks like this, and it's a little harder to see. So probably you'd want something like this instead. And yeah, just remember, you can always make your data look like this. So this is what you want if you had a time course. You can have a few rows that even show the same time point, but you need the values to be listed separately for each sample like this. So it's kind of important to have it, the data in this kind of format, and that will just make it a lot easier to plot it when you're in R. Then you just do G online and you're done, right? It's a lot easier that way. It's often easier to restructure the data to make it fit into a data frame really well than it is to try to force R to plot it in a way that it's not used to plotting it because ggplot works with data frames so well. So it's a lot better to work with it rather than against it. That's the point there. Here's something fun we can do. We can take literally any plot we have and plot it in polar coordinates. So if we take this time course plot, same thing we had before, right? x-axis is seconds, y-axis is value, and color is sample. We do geom line, still size equals 3, and the only thing we do is add coord polar. When we do that, it plots it all in polar coordinates. So now the x-axis is going around the circle, the y-axis is the radius, and color is still just the color of the line, which is the sample here. And so now it basically wraps the whole thing around a circle, which is pretty fun. We can also do these with violin plots. This is one of our previous violin plots that we're just going to plot in polar coordinates. And now they're sticking out of the circle like that. Not sure how useful this is, but it is fun. So if you ever need to make something in, col in polar coordinates, this is how you can do it. And we can do the same thing with a bar plot. This is a histogram where it's kind of wrapping around. This only really makes sense if you have something where the zero meets the highest value on the x-axis. Um, yeah, if you have something that makes sense in polar coordinates, this is how you can do it. This particular data set doesn't really make sense, but this is just to show you that you can do it, and you can do it very easily. Just put in coord polar, that's it. We can also make pie charts. And this is super easy. You basically just do summary of whatever you want to plot. So we're not using ggplot anymore. Not for this part. Pie charts are possible to make with ggplot, but you basically have to fake it using polar coordinates. And it's just kind of a mess to try to do that. It's possible, but I wouldn't really recommend it. Instead, we can take this summary of my data type and we get these type counts. So we have insertion, deletion, expansion, contraction. We have numbers for each one about how many counts we have. And that's basically all we need in order to draw a pie chart. So we say pi, which is how you make a pie chart. Type counts is the summary. And then we need a palette. So we say cull, which means what colors do you want for your pie chart. That's equal to brewer pal, which is how we, in the previous one, found palettes. So if we take this part, where we find a palette, we take the length of type counts, which is four different things, right? There are four things in here. So length of type counts is four. 
if we grab the Brewer palette, four colors from palette set one, then those are the four colors, the first four colors of the set one palette. That's what we get. And those are going to be the colors. And that's all the pie chart needs. It needs your numbers and your colors. And you can do that. And you can also do it without colors, but it's just not as pretty. They have some like weird pastel colors by default. So it looks like that. So instead, it's better if you put in some proper colors here, some brighter and nicer ones. Yeah, so you can grab those different palettes, just like we did in the previous thing. You can go find all the Brewer palettes. You can also type the numbers in yourself if you wanted. There's a lot of different options. All right, another thing we can do is draw Venn diagrams. So I chose an example here that I think occurs pretty often. Let's say that you find a list of genes that are overexpressed between different samples and you want to see how many of them are overexpressed or how many genes are mutated, for instance, in these four different samples even. So I'll show you what you can do here. Let's say we have four different samples, or let's say four different cell lines, and each of them has a certain number of genes that are mutated. So here I'm going to just read in this list of genes, and list A now contains a list of genes and it's really boring. It's a data frame that only has one row. So if I take this and go head list A, it only has one thing. To do a Venn diagram, we want only one column of it, so it can't really be a data frame anymore. And this is kind of a subtle point, but you don't really have to worry about it. You can just follow exactly what we're doing here. You read in the list, you grab that one column, and assign it to a list. So now we have a list of them. See how they're not listed um, as one column anymore? This is now a list of things instead of a table or a data frame. So this is, so A is now a list instead of a data frame. We're going to do the same thing with B. So now we also have a list of the genes in sample B, a list of the genes in sample C, a list of the genes in sample D. So now we have these four different lists and we can see, no we can't, we can say length. You can't do dim because it's a data frame. But you can see the length of each one. So that's kind of fun to do. Yeah, so we can see they all have different lengths. So those are all now lists of genes. Uh, we want to use the Venn Diagram package. If you want to know how to install something, you go over to Packages. Sometimes this is like down here, but recently we've needed all the space. So we go over to the tab that says Packages. You have your files, plots, packages. In Help, you can search for different things. So if you have an issue with like the G-sub that we used before, you can search for it and find Help here and viewer doesn't really do much. Packages, install, if you want to install the Venn diagram package, and here we just type in and it pops up, it says Venn diagram, and then you click install. And when you do that, since this box is checked, it's also automatically going to install any other packages that this package needs in order to function, which is awesome because that's one of the main issues with trying to install software for computational biology in general. It's always a nightmare trying to install different software because often they rely on other pieces of software and you have to have certain versions of those in order to get it to work and R and R Studio just help you out so much with that. So you can just install that. Since I already have it installed, I'm going to click cancel. But if you install it and just say yes to whatever they ask you, then it's going to install everything you need and you'll be fine. We have to say library Venn diagram whenever we use it because it's going to basically just go and check it on this list. So in here, it's checking off the things that we're using, right? We used this Plur package, however you say that. We used our color brewer recently. Some of these are always loaded. And so you can go in this list and check off the ones you want. But 
it's really nice if you have a script like this and say, okay, I'm going to use Venn diagram. And then you just put this in here, and when you run that line, it's automatically going to check it off. So I can uncheck it, and then if I run this, it checks it for me. And so when that's part of the larger program, you can like highlight the whole thing and run it. And then you don't have to go in here and check off which packages do I need. You just load them automatically by writing library Venn diagram. So that's what we'll do. It doesn't hurt to do it multiple times. We'll go back to our plots here. And Venn diagram is kind of odd. So the pie chart that we made, like this one, and the Venn diagrams, those aren't ggplot anymore. So we're not using the normal plotting package that's so useful, just because it doesn't really do pie charts and it doesn't really do Venn diagrams, at least not very well. It's possible, everything is possible in ggplot, but you really have to hack it in order to get it to do those things for you. So instead, we're going to use another package here, which is Venn diagram. And it only works by saving directly to a file, unfortunately, so we have to save these and then go look at what they are. But I'll show you, I'll just run this, go show you what it looks like, and then we're going to take a look at what's going on in the code. So it just made this, see how uh, it saved it to a file called Venn Diagram Genes 2.png. I'm going to open that up. It also made a log file, which you don't really have to use, but it makes that automatically. So you can just toss it away if you don't want it. So this makes a nice little Venn diagram. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So I'll just pull this aside a little bit so we can see everything. Make this smaller. OK, so now we can just look at the Venn diagrams. All right, so we still have our code right here, and we can see the Venn diagram as well. There it is. Okay. So I have this Venn diagram. It has two labels, list C and list D, and it has the numbers that are in each of those lists separately and the ones that they have that are shared. What we gave it was a list. And so this is just kind of funny notation. Don't really worry about what that list means, but it basically just makes a list that has labels. It's a little bit like a data frame, but just a slightly different thing. So you basically have list C is the name of a list that contains all the things that are in the C that we made before, right? The C that we just read in up here. So this is what C looks like. It has 2,273 2, genes in it. So we call it list C, it contains all the items in C. We have list D, it contains all the items in D. And then we just set what we want the fill colors to be, in this case yellow and cyan, and then it's going to mix those two colors together automatically. CEX equals 1.5, that is actually just the size of the text. So if you make it one, it'll be smaller. If you make it two, it'll be bigger. But CEX 1.5 is going to make it this size. So that's one more thing you can play with. That's the text size. And then file name equals whatever you want the file name to be. In this case, inside the lesson six folder, we want it to be Venn diagram genes 2.png. And that's the file name that it now has up here. So perfect. Let's take a look at the other ones too. So yeah, don't worry too much about what the list does. Here we just have A equals A, C equals C, D equals D. That's really all you have to say. You can also call them like the names of the different cell lines or whatever you want to do. But the one here is the label. On the left side of each equal sign is the label. And on the right side is the actual data that you found up before. So we'll run both of these as well and see how it deals with having multiple samples. So this one had only two lists of genes, 
And in this one, we're going to have three lists, A, C, and D. In this one, we're going to have all four lists, A, B, C, and D. And then we have to give it four different colors for those. Text size, CEX is the same. And we make the file names different so that they don't overwrite each other. And that's basically all we have to do there. If we go back here, I'll open up this one too. So this is what it looks like when we have three different ones. This was A, C, and D. And it automatically finds the overlap between these. So all you have to do is give it that list. And it automatically finds the overlaps and makes it look pretty decent. In this case, it scales it to match so that the overlap kind of represents the size of the list. But when there are three of them like that, you can't really make all that happen as easily and still make it look like a circle. And this one is even harder. If there's four different items, we have A, B, C, and D, and it's going to overlap them and show how many items are shared and unique to each one. In this case, there's nothing unique to B. Anything in B is either inside of C, A, or D. None of them are in D either, actually. Well, some of them are in D, but they're also in C then. <laughs> so like anything in B has to be either inside of a or C as well, so they're always shared with something else. So you can try to interpret this. It can be a little bit difficult, but when you need a diagram for your paper, this is one way to do it. So that's an option. Yeah, so if we were to change the left sides here, then that would change the labels. Right, so that could be list C or list D or whatever, sample, whatever this cell line, that cell line, and that's it. So, so we've gone through a lot of different things here. We've gone through how to plot just about everything. All of these can be done with ggplot. Then pie charts are kind of special. You have to use the pie function. And Venn diagrams, you have to use the Venn diagram package in order to make those. And those have to be saved to a file, unfortunately. And that's it for lesson six, plot anything. Thank you.